For our second message today, we have a sermon from Mr. Matthew Steele entitled, Beauty for Ashes. Mr. Steele. Thank you, Reg. I feel like I've got Kermit the Frog in my throat today, so I'm going to apologize ahead of time. So, um, as many of you know, I've mentioned it probably more times than I should have, but I'm a really big fan of the Chosen TV show. Everybody know what I'm talking about? Oh, come on, I've talked about it so much. The Chosen TV show, so it's a multi-series um, TV show about the life and ministry of Jesus. And um, it's certainly not reading the Bible, so, you know, that's the disclaimer that they, they put up, of course, uh, at, the, at the, the front of each season. But it is a, a really interesting uh, way in which to look at the stories of the Gospels and uh, just kind of get your mind thinking. And, and I suppose the biggest thing for me is to just kind of help me think about the humanity of Jesus and, and that he really was on this earth. He really was like you and I, and that he really did have struggles like you and I, and was tempted like you and I. And it, it's, it's just an enjoyable way of uh, looking at some of the scriptures uh, on the big screen. Not to mention the fact that it means that we're also not watching the junk that the rest of the world puts out, right? So that's, that's a further benefit. It's becoming a kind of a running joke in, in our household that uh, the boys are waiting to see which one of Renee or I will get upset and start tearing up at a particular scene in one of the episodes. And they kind of uh, laugh at us because they're so very moving. Um, and they're, they're doing a really good, good job. I've enjoyed lots of scenes. My favorite scene thus far is the scene where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and I think I played that uh, here in, in a small segment. But there is one scene that I really want them to show. I'm hoping that they will. Um, and it is the scene that we find in Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. Because I think it will just be a powerful scene um, for, for them to present. It's a very familiar passage. I feel like I've actually uh, read from this passage here not, not too long ago, and I, I keep coming back to it because there's so much in it. There's so much promise and hope. Uh, there's so much of the gospel and the, the message that Jesus is trying to give to us. So it says, so he came to Nazareth. G Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And you just think about that. You just stop there and think, as his custom was. Now, was it saying that his custom was every time he went to synagogue, he would volunteer to read? Or was it saying, as his custom was when he grew up in Nazareth, that when he went to synagogue, he would stand up to read? I kind of think it's the latter. This image in my mind of this young Jesus going to synagogue every Sabbath with his parents and standing up to read as a young boy, as a young man, as he developed into the man that he would become in his ministry. And so it's just kind of a, an interesting thing to think about. We think about some of our young people here. Um, it, it makes me think, I hope... He doesn't mind, but Curtis, it makes me think of Curtis, you know, being a young man um, and then, and, or actually being a young boy in my mind and then developing and growing in stature and in faith and now he's one of our teachers. And so, to my mind, I kind of see that happening uh, with Jesus in this moment and, and the, the experience that he had amongst those people in the synagogue. And we'll see later, of course, they remembered him. It says, he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. 
And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of our Lord. You know, and I imagine he was just beautiful and eloquent. It's a powerful passage. It's a hopeful passage. It's, it's a messianic passage. And here in this nondescript synagogue in Nazareth is the Messiah saying these words and announcing, as he says, that he is starting to fulfill this passage. He says, then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And all the eyes of them who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today... The scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I mean, that gives me goosebumps. Because imagine being able to be in a position where you could hear Jesus announcing, I am fulfilling the long promised scriptures, the long promised scriptures of the Messiah. So all bore witness to him, and they marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And then they said, is this not Joseph's son? Little. This is little Jesus. Joseph's son. Remember Joseph? What? What is he saying? And then he said to them, you will surely say this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. And then he said, assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But none of them was Elijah sent except to Zephyrath in the region of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel at the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and they led him to the brow of a hill on which their city was built, and they, that they might throw him down over the cliff. And then passing through the midst of them, he went away. There's a lot in this passage, isn't there? There's a lot in this, this just very short interaction. One of the big things that comes out to me, though, is <laughs> appropriate to what Ken talked about earlier. The absolute rage that came over these people to the point that they're going to take little Jesus and throw him over the cliff. Because they remembered him being a boy and growing up with them. And they are now so filled with rage, they want to throw him off the cliff. What? What is wrong with these people? But there are other things going on here as well. There's some symmetry going on. Because Jesus talks about the period of time in which Israel experienced the drought under Elijah. How many years was that? Three and a half years. How many years was the ministry of Jesus? Generally accepted, about three and a half years. Uh, but then the symmetry seems to change because it was a drought and a famine under the time of Elijah in Israel. But what was happening now? It was now the start of a three and a half year ministry of the real bread from heaven coming down to the earth. And that wellspring, right, that fountain of life, that water of life that Jesus said, if we drink it of him, we'll have internally inside of us forever. So there's some symmetry here about the time period. And there's then this oppositeness of how God is actually bringing down bread from heaven, bringing down that water of life. 
And what else? Healing wherever he's going to go. Healing of the lepers, lame, blind, whatever it may be. There's a lot going on in this passage. And then we get to the central reason. The central reason that Jesus is here at the moment that he is here and the work that he's about to begin is the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor to the cowering to the, the, the afraid the, the, the poor in spirit the, the just the cowering people he has sent me to heal the broken hearted the crushed to proclaim liberty to the captives. The captives, it's like, it's the imagery of the, the captive souls. Those that have been taken away into slavery. You know, in the British Museum, there's this obelisk that shows the captivity of, of Israel. And they've got these chains and these nose hooks. And they've got chained from one man to the other. And they're carried off into that captivity. That's the image that is used here. Proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, those that are broken in pieces, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And it's a very poetic passage. We, we like that flow and that imagery and it, it, it swells our hearts when we read that and we think about Jesus. But he was actually doing this. This is a very specific plan of salvation that he is working out. This is part of what his ministry is all about. And still it. It's still it in our lives today. Last time I spoke, I talked about agreements. And I, I don't know if you guys remember, but these agreements that I talked about are the things that we agree to, the lies that we agree to, the brokenness that we agree to in our life. And these agreements, we have basically agreed with the liar, agreed with the father of lies, that maybe we are not sufficient, that we are shameful, that we are just uh, not good enough. Take your, your pick. I kind of want to springboard a little bit off of that. Because we can't just identify those agreements. We can't just look at those things that are broken in our life and then stop there. Right? We have to do something else. We have to replace that understanding. We have to replace that experience with something else. Otherwise, those lies, those broken agreements will sap our joy. They will take away our strength and our faith. And we'll find ourselves agreeing to them again. So today I wanted to focus on the other side of the equation. After we have identified those agreements, after we have identified where we have fed into the lies that the enemy has sown into our life, what happens what do we do after that? You've heard the phrase, right? If all you have is a hammer, right, then, then everything that you see is what? A nail, right? So we have to look at this next step with a different perspective, with maybe a different set of tools. And we have to apply those tools differently. Specifically, we have to understand the truth of what Jesus Christ is saying to each one of us in our life. We have to look at the truth and look at where he is taking us with that truth. We have a choice, don't we? In all things, in all trials, in all difficulties, we have choices. And sometimes they, they feel really, really overwhelming, but we still have choices. We can choose to wallow in the suffering. We can choose to stay in that suffering. 
and use it as an excuse to continue in our behavior. Or we can lift our heads up and look at salvation, the salvation that Christ gives us, and look for specific things that we can do differently. We need to focus on healing the brokenness in our lives, but understand that there's good news. There is good news that we have been set free. If we're willing to let Jesus liberate us from the captivity of those lies. In Psalm 27, verses 12 and 13, King David says this. He says, Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and as such breathe out violence. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. I came across this passage the other day, and it, it's really powerful to me, because when I, I see that, that one phrase, that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And I realized I had some reticency about it. I was reticent about it. Can I really believe that I will see the goodness of the Lord in my life in this time? In this period of life? In the land of the living? Can I trust in that? We know, don't we, that we have promises. Precious promises. That in the new life to come, we have these eternal promises of of a new body, of an eternal existence, being free from the, the sin and death that so easily ensnares us. And we, we look forward to that, and we, we look forward to the promises of the kingdom, and so on. We know that we have that out there. But can we also expect, can we believe that God will bring goodness to us now, in this life, Peter says in chapter, uh, in 2 Peter chapter 1, in verse 2, he says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of the Lord Jesus, and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and goodness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which we have been given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So we have this great promise out there, don't we, ahead of us. But we're not fully of that divine nature yet, are we? So are we going to experience the goodness of God in this life? Paul says in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 7, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet, indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Again, these promises are they're feeling more future, aren't they? That we can gain that resurrection from the dead. But what about now? Well, Paul says that we are in the fellowship of his sufferings. That doesn't sound very good to me. Who likes to suffer? A fellowship of his sufferings, is, does that preclude us from then receiving good from God now in this life?
You know, we have sorrow, we have disappointment. We don't need a scripture to tell us that. We experience that. And there are certainly those uh, in what we could call loosely in the Christian community that believe that, well, if you are truly a believer, then you'll be blessed and you won't have those suffering. Right, the prosperity gospel and so on. We know for a fact that that's not true. We've experienced this truth. Can we live this life in Christ Jesus without experiencing suffering? What do you think? Well, the answer is yes, and the answer is no. Hedging my bets, right? True politician, I can't be wrong if I say it that way. It's inescapable that we suffer at at different times. But if all we do is focus on the suffering, then what is that? It's a nail. And all we have is that. That's all we'll see. If, if we only ever focus on the suffering, that's all we'll see. If we focus on our weaknesses, all we'll see is lack of strength. If we focus on heartbreak, then we will remain broken. If we, but, it, it, but, but this goes against the healing, doesn't it? This idea goes against the healing of what Jesus said that he has come to bring us. So has he come to bring us partial healing? Is this a process? What is it? Is he going to perform his work of healing and restoration, of liberating us, or not? Will we experience that in the land of the living? That's the question. That's the question each one of us has to ask. Will he give comfort to us to heal us? Will he liberate us from captivity of shame and guilt and loss and bitterness, whatever that may be? Paul says in verse, what was it, verse 12, continuing on in Philippians, Not that I have already attained, or I am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself as having apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Forgetting the things that are behind. That's an interesting word, forgetting. Because in my experience, the things that I want to remember, I forget. Right? And then the things that I don't want to remember are always there. I don't know why that is. But maybe it's because that's what we're focusing on. But the word that Paul uses here. It's, it means more than just forgetting. It means more than just putting it out of your mind. It means more than just finding where the keys are and putting it there. Because you'll definitely forget that. It means to neglect it. Neglect what was behind. Now why is that important? Well, what's the opposite of neglect? To care for take care of, to invest time and energy into. And so he's telling us, stop doing that. Neglect it. Let it die on the vine. Let those old things that pull us down, those old sins, those old wounds, those old arguments that will pull us back down, neglect them to the point that they will just diminish go away. And then he tells us to do something else. To focus on what is ahead. Does Paul have qualifications to tell us this? Yes. This is a man who persecuted the church. Who persecuted personally, rounded up Christians and oversaw 
the murder of Stephen, consenting to it. And who knows what else? Did he neglect that? When he repented of that, when he was called on that Damascus road, when his life was turned inside out, upside down, and set on a new path, did he keep returning to those moments, or did he let them just be neglected? That is in the past. There was nothing he could do about it. It was done. Instead, he says, he presses forward to the goal. And he takes strength, perhaps, from, from what he had unfortunately done. But now it's reversed, isn't it? That he's driven. He says in another place, that I may be all things to all men so that I might save some. In Christ Jesus. Letting go of the past. Neglecting the past. And moving forward to the goal, to those promises. He says, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, having this mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, and let us be of the same mind. And I find it really interesting here that he, he brings in this, this term mature. Because I think you've got to get to a certain maturity to understand what he is telling us to do. To leave behind those lies, those agreements. Leave behind that corruption and that old man and that old woman and walk in newness of life, stretching for the goal. What Jesus read in Isaiah 61, as recorded in Luke, that is very much a, his ministry, if you wanted to put it in a nutshell. But there was more going on in that passage. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him, and it was going to do more than just healing, more than just freeing us from sin and shame. He actually goes beyond that. So if we turn back to Isaiah 61 itself and read the passage in its entirety, there's a bigger, more expansive plan at work for each one of them. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. It isn't enough for him to just bring about healing. It isn't enough to just set us free. We have to exchange the past. We have to exchange the past, the guilt, the bitterness, the brokenness, the captivity, whatever that is for each one of us. We have to allow him to exchange it for something. Those agreements and lies have to be exchanged for something. He says that he's going to give us beauty or ashes. And what does that refer to? Well, what were ashes used for? They were used in mourning, weren't they? When the disaster would strike, when you lose a loved one or whatever that situation was or you were broken apart through because of sin or something terrible that had happened in your life. You'd rend your clothes and pour ashes upon your head. It was a mourning. It was an act of mourning and everyone around you knew you were in a dark place. Right? That you were struggling. And I sometimes wonder if it would be useful for us to have something like that today. You know? 
because we put on a facade that says, how are you? Oh, I'm doing fine. But five minutes ago, we just got terrible news, and we're not doing fine. And we don't have maybe a mechanism in our culture to just share, I might be a little off today, so don't be angry with me. I'm going through struggles. Give me some grace. But that's essentially what's going on here. Wearing sackcloth and ashes this morning. But then Jesus wants to replace that. He wants to exchange that. So we'll stop mourning. There has to come a point, doesn't there, where we will stop the mourning process. And we think about it in terms for a loved one. Does that mean that we love that, that loved one any less when they have passed? No. But can we constantly live the rest of our life in mourning? Jesus wants to take that. He wants to take that shame, that sin, that mourning, the thing that we are, have lost, and he wants to exchange it for beauty. And the word beauty here is interesting because they would take the ashes and pour it on their head. The word beauty here means to anoint the head with a garland, to something that beautifies the person. Maybe even a crown. But something that goes on their head can now give beauty and replace the ashes, replace that that he is exchanging. Exchanging our ashes for breathtaking beauty. That's what he wants to do. And to anoint our heads with oil, which means with fatness, with plenty, with a beautiful smelling aroma, just an intoxicating aroma of joy and, and gladness. It's amazing, isn't it, how odors can sum up feelings in us. And, and, and tastes too. Whenever I smell like raspberries, I was probably say it all the time to my wife, we're in Costco and we're getting some raspberries. It, it, I am back as a boy in, in England, the side of the roads in the, the, the farming areas, picking raspberries off the bushes with my mom and my brother and sister. Just immediately transports me. One for the bag, one for me, one for the bag. One a lot of time spent in the bathroom later that night. But that sweet fragrance, right, exchanged for what? Bitterness and stink, stench, and the things that are dark, that are in our life, and that we're still trying to hold on to. Let him exchange that, that for beauty. Does our heart long for beauty? Does it is it desire, beauty, and joy? It's available to us. Jesus has come to give us that in the land of the living. The goodness of God in the land of the living, in this time now. And Isaiah continues, and it almost, you know, it definitely becomes prophetic. There's, there's more to come. But I want you to look at it still as though it's talking about us as a person and not just necessarily as Israel as a, as a nation. Because remember, God also looks at Israel as a person. He says, Israel, my firstborn. And we are his children. So in verse 4, he says, and they shall rebuild the old ruins and raise up former desolation. They shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. Are there parts of our life that are desolate? He can rebuild them. Working in us, he can rebuild those parts of our life that are broken. Rebuild those desolations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. I don't have any flocks, but if strangers want to bring me some flocks, that would be good. And the sons of the foreigner shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But you shall be named the priests of the Lord. What is those promises? You shall be kings and priests in that eternal kingdom of God. 
They shall call you the servants of our God. You shall eat the riches of the nations, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, you shall have double honor, and instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land they shall possess double. Everlasting joy shall be theirs, for I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery for burnt offering. I will direct their work in truth. And I will make them an everlasting covenant. Do we have that everlasting covenant now? That's, that's the new covenant, isn't it? It's an everlasting covenant. And so these promises are for us also. Their descendants shall be known among the Gentiles. Their offspring among the people. All who see them shall acknowledge them. That they are the prosperity whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its bud, and the garden causes the things that are sown in it to bring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. And who is that, if not the same? Who is that, is not us, springing forth in righteousness, resurrected, redeemed, and singing what? Praises. Singing the new song to God. This is the work in its fullest extent. This is what Jesus was called to do. It is what he is doing in our lives now what he will bring about in the future. We will have joy. We will have salvation. And it's interesting. In this passage here it says where am I? Yeah, in verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation and has covered me with the robe of righteousness. The war will be over. When we get to that point, the war is over. And the reason that we know the war is over is because of what we read in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 14 through 17. Remember, we just, we just did this in the Bible study. It's the armor of God, right? But in the midst of this, armor here. It says, stand therefore having, gir- having girded your waist with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Right now we need a breastplate of righteousness. We need a tough, protective shield on our, on our body, on our most sensitive organs so that we can stay alive in the battle. But when we reach the end of Isaiah 61, It's not a breastplate anymore. It's a robe. It's a robe of righteousness. We won't have to have the armor anymore. We won't need that armor in that way anymore. When the work of Jesus Christ is fully completed, we're going to have this robe of righteousness. That white robe of righteousness the Lord, the righteous judge, gives us at his return. Until then, we have to endure. Until then, we have to be in this fellowship of his suffering. But that's not the same thing as suffering in our sin. The fellowship of his suffering is not the same thing as, as, as mourning our past as holding on to these agreements and these lies that have been seeded in our life. It is not the same thing. His suffering strengthens. His suffering brings endurance, mental strength, and it will not permit us to be moved or shaken around anymore. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, Paul says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard-pressed on every side, 
yet not crushed. We're not that broken down person anymore. Let Jesus perform that work in us. And we are not crushed. We are perplexed. And yeah, we're a little confused sometimes at how a pastor in, a, in, in England, a, a so-called Christian country, can be arrested for reading the Bible. How did we get to that place? We can be perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. They can strike us down, but they cannot destroy us. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our mortal flesh. So then, death is working in us, but life in you. If we let Jesus do his work. We let him exchange our ashes for the beauty that he will give us. For the, for the oil of joy and the garment of praise, for the weight of that past and the weight of the sin and the brokenness. His life will be manifested in it, just as Paul said. Let him do those things. He will be manifest in us, in the land of the living. Not after we have died and resurrected, but in this life as well. We can have that. To close, I'd like to read Psalm 27 in its entirety because these are part of the promises that we can hold on to in life. These are the great promises of the goodness of God, not just in the future, but in this life, in this time that we have. He says in verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock, and now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me or forsake me. O God of my salvation, when my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversary. adversary. For false witness have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart, unless I had believed, that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord.